Welcome to the Russian Rulers History Podcast, Episode 111. Boris Yeltsin, The Early Years Well, I'm back from my adventure to Australia, ready to continue on with the next-to-last Russian ruler, Boris Yeltsin. For the first time in 40 podcasts, though, I'll be covering a true Russian ruler once again. Now, if you remember way back when, in episode 110, we covered the end of the Soviet Union and the fall of its leader, Mikhail Sergeyevich Gorbachev. Lasting just over 74 years, the USSR tried a bold experiment to run a country using a Marxist-Leninist system. But, due to numerous reasons, it failed, closing up shop on December 31st, 1991. The man who would take the reign of power in Russia was a truly paradoxical and highly controversial figure, one Boris Yeltsin. A man who was a card-carrying communist, an apparatchik became the first democratically elected head of the Russian state. It is one of the many contradictions that define Yeltsin's life. Born on February 1, 1931, just 29 days before Mikhail Gorbachev, to poor peasant parents in the Urals, on the edge of Siberia, Boris was one of three children of Nikolai and Klavdia Yeltsin. Now, the name Yeltsin comes from the word yel, or Russian, for fir tree. The main work I will be drawing much of my information about Boris will be Timothy Colton's epic work, Yeltsin a life. If you're truly interested in this man and have the time to read over 400 pages of an incredible biography, this is a must read. Now, Yeltsin's ancestors were likely old believers, a schismatic breakaway group that seceded from the main Russian Orthodox Church in the 1650s in response to Patriarch Nikon's reforms. His family was believed to have come from Novgorod and migrated and settled in and around the town of Basmanova, also known as Basmanovskoya. The first relative of Boris that we know of was one Sergei Yeltsin, who was a state peasant who lived in the 1700s. A state peasant was a serf, but with far greater freedoms than a landed serf owned by private individuals. The state peasant could marry whomever they wanted within cultural constraints. They could also move around with few restrictions and basically just needed to pay a fixed rent to the government. This was as opposed to the landed serf who owed specific services to their master. Another difference was that the state serf was subject to civil law, while the landed serf was subject to the master's whim. Now, this gives the Yeltsin family a leg up on many of their fellow Russian citizens. Well, that is, until the time of Joseph Stalin. The two towns that the Yeltsins called home were Butka and Basmanova, with most of the male side of the family coming from the latter. The family was led by highly industrious men and women over the years. This made the Yeltsins upper middle class, with land and a real rarity in the region, a framed house, which amazingly enough, stands to this day over 110 years after it was built. Life before the revolution was reasonably good for hard-working people like the Yeltsins, but with the onset of the horrific Russian Civil War being fought back and forth through their region, much of their food and animals were confiscated. Boris's father, Nikolai, born in Basmanova in 1906, was the middle child of five. He did side with the Bolsheviks, but not really wholeheartedly. In the 1920s, he became active in the Basmanovo Soviet until he married Klavdia Vasilevna Starinya in 1928. The couple was both more than capable of fashioning a better household than the average peasant. This was the time of Lenin's NEP, or New Economic Policy, 
which allowed the more industrious to carve out a better place in society, as well as economically. This, as we know, was short-lived, as Joseph Stalin was taking over and his plans were to change things drastically, especially getting rid of Lenin's nip. On February 1, 1931, one Boris Nikolaevich Yeltsin became the first-born child of his parents, Nikolai and Klavdia. He was baptized in the Russian Orthodox faith, but almost drowned during the ceremony when the inebriated priest dropped him into the font, where he fell to the bottom before being pulled out by his mother. By this time, Stalin's new policy of forced collectivization and the departure from Lenin's nep was in full swing, much to the detriment of the Yeltsin family. They were considered part of the hated Kulak class, the well-to-do peasants. In May of 1928, only 1% of all peasants were collectivized. By March of 1930, just a couple years later, 67% were. By 1935, the last of the Yeltsin clan's horses and cows were sold or confiscated. They were now for all intents and purposes, state serfs once again. While the names had changed from serf to collectivized peasant, the situation was the same. The state owed you and controlled your life and what you could do or could not do. Then the hard times hit in 1932 and 1933. The young Yeltsins had moved to Butka from the more populous Basmanovo. During 1932 and 1933, things were dire in most of the Soviet Union. The government upped their demands for all agricultural production to be turned over. They really cared little whether or not there was enough left over for the peasant to survive on. The state's interests trumped that of the individual. The specter of cannibalism hung over the people, and there is some very strong hints that this desperate act indeed happened in the town. So the question is, why did the Yeltsin family move to the less desirable town of Butka? Well, the reason being, Ignaty Yeltsin, Boris's grandfather, was designated as a kulak, which made him and his extended family a target of the local Soviet and Communist Party members. So they moved to the new town. Ignaty and his wife, though, were eventually sent and Najinsk and Sverdlovsk, about 400 miles south of the Arctic Circle. Ignaty died there in the Gulag in 1936. Now, Klavdia's parents also suffered during the purges of the 1930s, but not nearly as much as Nikolai's. In the early 1930s, Boris's family moved to Kazan, but in 1934, Nikolai and his brother Andrian were arrested by the OGPU secret police for, quote, anti-Soviet agitation and propaganda. A trumped-up charge, for sure. But the time was actually quite good, as had they picked up next year after 1935, they likely would have been executed during Stalin's great purges. Instead, Nikolai was forced to work on the Moscow-Volga Canal for a little over two years. It was an incredibly dangerous job, with thousands dying during construction. By late 1936, Boris's father came back. He found his family staying with an ex-cellmate, as his wife and child had been thrown out of the barracks they lived in due to Nikolai's arrest. For a brief time, Klavdia and Boris were homeless. From there, the Yeltsins moved to Berezneki, a place filled with NKVD prisoners, but they went willingly, hoping for work to keep them alive. Nikolai worked for the North Urals Health Industry Construction Trust. It was brutally hard, but they had survived. Had any of them been prisoners instead of voluntarily living in Berezniki, they would have likely been executed. Tens of thousands were murdered, averaging 11 a day during the great peak of the purges in 1937 and 38. But instead, 
They kept their noses clean and complained little. There is Nikki was, by the late 1930s, the chemical capital of the Soviet Union. It was not a place one would choose to live in, although, if you had been considered an enemy of the state at any time, you really had little choice. As Varlam Shalamov, a one-time prisoner in Berezniki, described the population, quote, The mass of the builders of the city were exiles and resettled people, dekulakized peasants from central Russia, Tataria, and Ukraine, politically unreliable elements, counter-revolutionaries, and tech intellectuals, and so forth. Later, during World War II, they would be joined by deported Volga Germans, Crimean Tatars, etc. In Timothy Colton's biography of Yeltsin, he writes how Boris and his family put much of the memories and recollections of the 1930s into kind of a type of foggy vault. As he puts it so eloquently, quote, for those who came of age in the shadow of such barbarism, Yeltsin among them, putting a lid on the recapitulation of terror was a psychological defense mechanism and insurance against repercussions from babbling about it. The trouble was that over the years and the decades, the repression fed on itself. The later the sufferings of the elders were owned up to, the more the silence had to be explained, which in turn raised the cost of making a clean breast of it, and finally moving on. After the purges, the Yeltsin family fully settled in Berezniki. The town had about 65,000 inhabitants in 1939, 65,000 people living in one of the bleakest places on earth. Colton shares an 1890 travel log in his book that perfectly describes the city. The closer you got to Usle, the grimmer and more mournful the river banks. You no longer see forest. The fields are without greenery. On both banks, you find salt barns linked by dark, cold tunnels. Great black salt works stand out against the pewter sky and create an impression of doom. During World War II, or the Great Patriotic War as it was known in the Soviet Union, Berezniki was a center for chemical weapon manufacturing with absolutely no regard for the environment or the people there. To this day, the city and the surrounding area is an environmental nightmare. You can go there today and see a containment pond that glows in iridescent green and never freezes. Children have abnormally high death rates and are, according to statistics, eight times more likely to have blood ailments than any other city in Russia. Such was the bleakness in young Boris Yeltsin's life. It was also near a number of well-populated gulags, including a prisoner of war camp that at one point held 11,000 men. Other camps of slave labor were built to work the salt mines, paper mills, lumbering, and the construction of hydroelectric dams. The number of people in slave labor often dwarfed that of free citizens. The home where the Yeltsins live, if you could call it a home, was a two-story wood barrack with paper-thin walls. It was a drafty place, which, in the winter, was so cold that the children huddled with their nanny goat named Polya. This was intolerable to Boris's father, Nikolai, so through careful saving, planning, and more than likely greasing the palms of local party officials, he built a four-room brick house. Boris Yeltsin makes no mention of the house in his autobiographies. Colton supposes that this oversight was likely on purpose, as this was a valuable asset and quite rare in the so Socialist Soviet Union. The year was 1944, and the Yeltsin family added another child, a girl named Valentina. Questions have come up about the religious upbringing of Boris as he turned to the Orthodox Church during his presidency. While he was baptized, it was the mother who was really the religious one, 
but she had to practice her faith quietly. The only church in Berezniki, the church of the beheading of John the Baptist, was shuttered in 1937, only reopening in 1992 during her son's reign as the head of the Russian government. Growing up, Boris endured numerous beatings from his father. Many psychologists would make a case for Yeltsin's personality being shaped by it, but reality be known, most Russian boys and many girls were subjected to corporal punishment. It was a way of life. But his father was not a monster. He was an inventive, hard worker who passed on his work ethic to his son. As Boris Yeltsin put it in his autobiography, Confession, quote, My father was always trying to invent something. One of his dreams was to come up with an automated machine that would lay bricks. He would sketch it out, do drawings, think it over, make calculations, then produce another set of drawings. It was kind of a phantom for him. Alas, no one has ever invented such a gizmo, although even now whole research institutes rack their brains over it. He would describe it to me, what his machine would be like, and how it would work, how it would mix the mortar, put down the bricks, clean off the excess, and move along. He had worked it all out in his head and had drawn the general plan for it, but never realized the idea in metal. Hunger was a big part of life, especially during and immediately after the war. As Klavdia, Boris's mother, recalls, quote, Hunger returned to us in the first winter of the war. Bortia would come home from school, sit in the corner of the room, and begin to moan inconsolably. I'm hungry. I can't take it. At moments like this, my heart would bleed because I had nothing to feed him with, not even a stale crust. All foodstuffs were being distributed through ration cards, and they were calculated at a minimal level. The daily norm for bread, practically the only thing they gave out, was 800 grams for workers and 400 grams for their dependents. On the black market, they asked one quarter of a month's pay for a baguette. From time to time, I had to send the children to the restaurant in our neighborhood so they would be fed out of kindness. The children and I had to swallow no small amount of pride because of this. Now, as Boris remembered it, quote, My childhood went by rather cheerlessly. There weren't delights or delicacies, nothing like that. We just wanted to survive, survive. And survive. While his father did not become a member of the Communist Party, Boris began to join the Communist Youth Movement. First, he joined the Young Pioneers in 1939, and later, in 1945, the Komsomol, the Communist Youth League. Yeltsin did enjoy a well-rounded early education, moving up from elementary to secondary school. When he was 15, he became a man in a new world post-war. Soviet society had changed due to the huge losses of men. In some regions of the USSR, women in their 20s outnumbered men by two to one. Women became a major influence in young men's world, as well as serving as role models. During his school years, Boris was a born leader and an excellent student. As one of his classmates, Vladimir Zhdanov, recalls, quote, He had authority. We often turned to him for advice, and every year we elected him class monitor. He always studied hard and willingly. Every subject came easily to him. He would often be called to the blackboard, particularly when someone was not able to answer. His best subject was mathematics. Borya had a mathematical cast of mind. He was always to the first to finish in quizzes and would then pass his exercise book around the class. He never minded if we copied the answers. He was a good comrade to all. Now, in order to continue your education in the Soviet Union, you had to excel. Few made it through to the 10th grade. Colton gives us an example. In the 1948-49 school year, and it had 660 boys in the 1st through 4th grade, with only 19 left in 10th grade. And when he turned to 18 in 1949, Boris Yeltsin moved to Sverdlovsk, 
to attend the Urals Polytechnic Institute, a 16-hour train ride from Berezniki. The town is now better known as Ekaterinaburg, the town where Tsar Nicholas II and his family was murdered in 1918. It was named Sverdlovsk after the Bolshevik Yakov Sverdlov, the man who authorized the execution of the royal family. Now, this is the place where we're going to pause. So join me next time as we continue on from his early ch adulthood to his elevation as the first secretary of the Sverdlovsk Oblast. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. Please go to the blog site at www.russianrulershistory.com where I'm rating the 10 worst and 10 best Russian rulers. Also, come over to Facebook and join our ever-growing group to ask questions, leave comments, or make suggestions. So now, as always, до свидания и спасибо большое.